Good afternoon, everyone. This is Linda Bessmer, Managing Partner of Muses 3 LLC. I'm pleased to introduce our author talk panelists, Harmony School of Excellence Sugarland, our host school, represented by Ms. Faye, Dean of Academics, Ms. Huttenhoff, eighth grade social studies teacher, and Ms. Espinoza, eighth grade ELAR teacher and Michael Bergen, our author. First, some housekeeping issues. For those of you that are not in the classroom at Harmony School of Excellence Sugarland, if you would like to submit your <coughs> questions, at the bottom of your Zoom screen, there is a Q&A uh, folder. And if you click on that button, you can type in your students' questions, and we will certainly um, get them uh, to Mr. Bergen to answer as time permits. And now I'd like to go ahead and introduce um, Ms. Fay, um, Dean of Academics from Harmony School of Excellence, Sugarland. And I'm going to ask her to go ahead and introduce her team and today's author. Good afternoon and welcome to Harmony School of Excellence in Sugarland. I'm Cheryl Fay, the Dean of Academics. Uh, HSE is a STEM-focused six through eight middle school. We are part of the highly successful Harmony Public School System. We are a brand new campus having uh, just opened our doors last school year. Uh, so I would like to introduce um, Ms. Uh, Huttenhoff, who teaches eighth grade social studies, <coughs> and Ms. Espinosa, who teaches eighth grade Ealing. Thank you so much for being our host and, and making this opportunity a possibility. Thank you so much. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our guest author, Mr. Michael Bergen. Mr. Bergen has written more than 250 fiction and nonfiction books for children and young adults. He has written many biographies and is a, has produced playwright and editor of the Biographer's Craft, a newsletter for biographers international organizations. Today, we will learn more about the American labor reform movement, the relationship between arts and change in the American way of life, primary and secondary sources such as interviews and artifacts, making connections to personal experiences, characteristics of multimodal and digital text, and author's first purpose and message within a text. And now here's Michael Bergen. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity to talk about exploring hidden worlds, about uh, Jacob Rees and his photography. I'll give you a little bit of background about me. I've been writing books for kids, uh, students of all ages for about 30 years. Well, I started writing for a classroom newspaper called Weekly Reader, which some of the teachers might remember. Uh, I've been freelancing, writing books for 25 years. And as Ms. Faye said, I have written over 250 books. I really prefer writing about American history and about biographies. Um, and as you've seen, if you've read the book, uh, there's a lot about Jacob Reese's life and how his life uh, affected his, his later work. My editor thought it was important to show how his early experiences and even as an adult, how those experiences um, affected him and made him want to document the social problems of the day, especially as he um, saw the immigrants coming into the city, to New York City, from all over the world. Uh, the immigration really was booming during the 1880s when he started his work. Um, this book is a part of a larger series called Captured History. You might have seen some of the other titles uh, in the library or at Mayan. There's quite a few of them there. And the, the idea is to take one significant picture from American history or a series of pictures as with the Reese book and talk about what was happening at the time that they were taken, uh, the technology being used to take them, and then why they have such a lasting impact today. Um, another book I wrote in the series, Breaker Boys, was about the similar time period and some of the same issues. And I'll talk a little bit more about that one later on that focuses exclusively on child labor, which of course comes up in the Reese book since he documented children at work. Um, uh, so Reese's, his, his book that he wrote during the uh, 1890s was called how the other half lives. And his intent was to show Americans who lived maybe in wealthy parts of cities or, or away from cities and rural areas, 
what the immigrants were going through as they as they came to, to New York. Not, of course, they didn't go exclusively to New York, but many did pass through Ellis Island, which is where immigrants were proce processed starting in the 1890s. And they ended up staying in New York. And he wanted to show other people what the conditions were like. And I think um, even though the pictures are more than 100 years old, they, they, they still have an impact for us as we see how these people struggled coming to a new country and, and dealing with the conditions that they saw. And it reminds us, I think, that some of those issues are still very relevant today. Um, certainly, we, immigration is in the news quite a bit, more maybe with illegal immigration or the refugee situation, but it's still become a, a very big issue, certainly in the last few years. And the problems that immigrants face, such as poverty and, and homelessness, those are still issues that are here today. So I think that's one reason why his work is, um, is very relevant to today. Um, Ms. Faye talked about the sources I use, and that all historians use, primary versus secondary. Um, for this book, the primary sources included newspapers of, from, from the time when, when Jacob was working. Um, so that would be the New York Times and other New York papers. Some of those are available online. In some cases, I saw reprints um, printed in other books. And then, uh, of course, a very important primary source is Reese's own writings, where he reflects on what he saw as he went into the, uh, the slums of New York, and then his reflections on what, what he did see. The only problem uh, as a historian, if, is, if I can call myself that, is that um, the, second, the primary sources, like a memoir, can be a little tricky because people tend to, if they're writing about themselves, they tend to want to put themselves in the best light. They might leave out certain things. Um, I'm not implying that Jacob Reese did that at all, but um, it, it is something to consider when you're dealing with that kind of a primary source. And then for secondary sources, it would be, I think for this book in particular, it was mostly biographies written by Reese, of Reese, by other writers. Um, there was a, if, if you've read the book, you might have seen that there were quotes uh, from, a, I believe he was a Danish writer like Reese, uh, Tom Book Swinty, and I tried to bring in other experts' opinions on, on Reese's life and his work. Um, for me, this book had some personal significance. Uh, I am the grandchildren of immigrants. I'm sure many of you are the children or grandchildren of immigrants or immigrants yourself. So I would think you'd be able to relate to um, the, the things that people face, the issues and problems people face when they come to a new country and have to deal with a new language and perhaps not knowing anybody else there and then finding a job and a place to live. Um, I was interested in immigration from when I was a kid. We, growing up, and I don't know if kids still do this today, but we would talk about, well, what are you? Meaning, what was, what was your ethnic background? Where did your grandparents or, or farther back uh, ancestors come from. And uh, for me, it was very strong because I grew up next to my grandparents who were immigrants from Italy. So I was very aware of the fact that they came over when they were just teenagers. Um, they, I think for my grandfather, he did have an older uncle he was traveling with. I'm not sure about my grandmother, but they came over very young. And they, again, they didn't, they weren't well educated. They didn't know English. And uh, so, I, their experience always fed my interest of, um, of, of immigration and my roots. Um, so I know that many of you probably do have the same kind of uh, interest in knowing where your, your family came from and, and what happened when they settled here in the United States. Um, I know that Harmony is based in, is, well, the Harmony system itself is based in Houston. I know you guys are close to Houston and that it's an incredibly diverse city uh, I did some research and the Census Bureau says that 29% of the people who live in Houston were born in a foreign country. Um, that's, that's a pretty high number, I, I think. I don't know what... Um, so again, 29%, that's a lot of immigrants. And then, of course, children of immigrants just in your area. And of course, since Texas and Mexico share a border, you're, you're probably reading quite a bit about the immigration issues going on along the border. I live in New Mexico, so... I also hear a lot about the issues um, of, of the illegal immigration, the refugees, and uh, it's, it's definitely a part of, of daily life here. Um, are, are there any, I'm assuming, or I shouldn't assume, are there any kids in the class who are immigrants who've, who were born in another country? 
I see a couple of hands. It's a very tiny picture, so it's hard for me to see. What, what countries are you from? Can you, would you mind telling me? Would anybody like to stand up and say where they're from? Where, where their family comes from? Go ahead. I'm not hearing anything. From India? Okay. Okay, well, I'll, I'll move on. <laughs> um, so back to, 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 to immigration and me. Um, by the time I got through high school, um, it was clear from things that I'd learned that not everybody in the country welcomes immigrants. And I think that's a theme that um, is in Reese, the book about Reese. There were people at the time who were uh, starting to, to want to restrict immigration. And certainly that's, that's still the case today. Um, in college, I did much more research about immigration and the anti-immigrant feelings. In the 1850s, there was a strong, uh, I don't say hatred, but dislike of, of Roman Catholics, people from, especially from Ireland. And um, then there were also people that um, later on who opposed Jews and Italians and people from Russia and, and from all other countries. All, so that was a, a, a really strong theme. But at the same time, there were people who did welcome immigrants because businesses in particular have wanted immigrants to take on jobs that maybe other people wouldn't do, or there's, there was a shortage in general. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. But there have been impulses throughout, uh, for the, especially the last 150 years of wanting to keep out certain immigrants, especially if they were considered different from the majority of Americans or somehow inferior. Um, in the 19th century, the people who wanted to restrict immigration were called WASP sometimes. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard that phrase before stands for white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. It meant people who came primarily from the United Kingdom and, and Scandinavia and uh, Northern Europe in general. And they did not like people who came from other parts of Europe or other parts of the world. Um, so as far as the immigration issues today, I think it's become very, very um, focused since President Trump took office. He has, has made limiting immigra immigration a big part of his platform, both legal and, and to, I mean, both illegal and to some degree, legal, illegal and then legal as well. Um, and the number of refugees who are people who are escaping uh, wars usually or national disaster, natural disasters, things like that. Um, the number we allow in every year has, has gone down a little bit. And, at, and as in the past, at times, some people believe some of the efforts to curb the immigration are rooted in um, prejudice against people who are considered different than, than they are. Um, the effort to start really restricting immigration began in the 1880s, right around when, when Reese was, was working. Um, that before that though, the, the, there was no federal, the national government in Washington did not do anything with immigration. It was really left up to the states. But then the, the federal government came in, passed a law to keep Chinese immigrants out of the country um, and then other laws tried to keep out very poor people, people with severe diseases, people who couldn't read, or people who held what were considered radical uh, political beliefs. But people found a way to get around some of those laws. They could simply lie. And um, that, so they, they made it in, even though the, the laws were on the books. And it turned out that very few people were kept out of Ellis Island, which is where so many immigrants came, especially ones from Europe. Um, about 25 million immigrants arrived in Ellis Island between 1880 and 1917. And just a small number were kept out because of those laws on the books. Um, then later laws were set up to actually limit the number of people per country that, that came in. And those laws were targeted at the people from Southern and Eastern Europe that were considered at the time not desirable immigrants. And I don't know if, I would assume some of you are have a background where your grandparents or great grandparents came from Italy or Greece or Poland or some of the countries that were targeted by this. And you might not have known that there were these restrictions at the time uh, after 1924. And um, it, how, do you think that it's, it's, it was fair for them to target um, specific countries like that? I mean, I, do you have any thoughts about the efforts in general to limit immigration? So do you all think that was fair? No, uh, no, no. no I guess not. <laughs> we have a picture of Jacob, so you can, there he is. Um, he, he was working, as I said, when the, the big wave of immigration began in the 1880s. There had been um, 
course, immigration ever since the country was founded, but in 18, the 1880s really saw a huge rise in, um, in immigration. And so he, he was an immigrant himself, as I said, he, and he settled in New York. He, was, he got into newspaper reporting and he actually worked, uh, he reported about crimes that went on in New York City. And because people who are, don't have a lot of money uh, sometimes we'll, we'll break the law to try to get food or, 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 or what they need. And so there was a crime in the immigrant areas and he saw that firsthand, but, uh, he wanted to, so he wanted to document that and, and let people see what was, what the conditions were that sometimes led people to crime or to kept kids out of school because they had to go to work. Um, if you read the book, you know, some of the conditions he, he saw, um, do you, do you think his being an immigrant himself maybe influenced what he wrote about, what he chose to uh, present? I, um, it seems to me that, that the personal experience, you know, certainly fuels, just as my personal experience fueled my interest in writing about this, yes. And um, to me, it was, a, it was a, a good choice for the cover. We could have used it in one of any number of pictures because there's a lot of very powerful ones, but it, it seems to, um, to show the hardship that the children in particular faced. I don't know what, did you, did anyone have a reaction when the first time they saw this picture? What, what does it make you think of? Um, Let's see if I see a hand or not. So is it, this photo is in a lot of his, he, he focused on children. And uh, I, I'm guessing that's because he felt that that would kind of stir some sympathy in the in the viewers, I mean, he he was definitely taking pictures to get a reaction from the people he 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 would show the pictures to. He actually took them around in these shows called Magic Lantern shows, and and put the pictures up like on a, a giant screen, and then talked about what he saw. I mean, he he was not just doing this to be a, well, he was doing it to be a reporter, but he had a larger goal of of then making people want to make changes. Um, that was that was what he was he was looking to do. He wanted he wanted to improve the conditions. He wanted to have the laws enforced that were already on the books about housing conditions and things like that. And he wanted people to to take new steps to um, to make life a little easier for the immigrants. Now this photo is a little different from some of the ones he has, and it's maybe a little controversial because he staged it. That is, he he found these boys and told them to to pose like this so he could take the picture. Um, but I think, and he, he, he said, and I think it's true that, it, that I don't think it makes it a less accurate or less important picture because he had seen these same scenes when in New York, he had seen boys sleeping on these grates where warm air came out from underground. And this was how they stayed warm and they had nowhere else to sleep. So he, he had, he thought it was okay to stage this because it, he knew it was based in reality. Now you might feel it's not as powerful because it was staged. Um, but it's, it, it's, I think, uh, it was a legitimate use of that. And at the time, um, photography was very new. I think, you know, we can kind of lose sight of that in the 1880s. Um, there was photography, but it wasn't people were just starting. I mean, I think, uh, George Eastman who created the Kodak camera, he was like the 1880s where people could buy smaller cameras that they could uh, easily develop their own films. Before that, photography was very complicated and uh, most newspapers didn't run photos. So that's why he did the Magic, Lan Magic Lantern shows because people wouldn't see the real image. They might see a drawing based on his picture, but he wanted them to see the real image. Um, so I think the fact that people didn't see a lot of photos, it wasn't part of daily life the way it is now when they saw his ones like this and the others showing the harsh conditions, it really had an impact. Um, of course, today we have the problem of not staging photos, but certainly people can manipulate them. They can make changes very easily with computers and Photoshop. Uh, my, my question is how many, how, my question is how many, uh, how many pictures did a retake that were posed? That were what? Posed? That were posed. This is the only one that I've read about. I, I don't know if any of the others were. I know in the book it talks about um, how he would kind of just burst in on people that they wouldn't even know he was coming and he would just kind of catch them off guard. 
So I, this is the only one that I saw that there was reference as being posed. I'm, cu I'm curious when I asked about people who came from other countries, what, what countries are, are representative? Where if, if you guys, if any of you are actually, were actually born in another country, what countries? I was born in Tanzania. I was like, my, my family is born like in Tanzania. I'm in America. Oh, okay. That's cool. That's great. Um, my family was from in India. From in, were you born there or just they came from there? Uh, they came from it. Okay. Okay, great. The next one is one that he took um, of people in a very crowded apartment, if you can call it that. I mean, it, as you can see that you have what, there's four people in the picture. I believe you don't know if there are other people who, well, it's like more than four. I see, now I see six. There's six people in that small space. Um, there could be more. This was just kind of common at the time. It, these, these old housing or apartment buildings were subdivided and people were crowded into uh, to one space. And he, what, part of what Reese wanted to do was to show that landlords were breaking the law. There were laws on the books about how many people could be in an apartment or how, what kind of sanitation or water they had. But the landlords just ignored it because they just wanted the money. And um, so th this was part of Reese's efforts. And I think Ms. Fay mentioned this uh, before, the, the reform movement at the time called, it's called the progressive era. The people who were, wanted to make changes were called progressives. They were looking to improve living conditions for, for poor people, immigrants in particular. They were looking to improve working conditions in factories. Um, there were very few laws during this time that held business owners or landlords responsible. They could pretty much do what they wanted. And so this reform movement, this progressive movement was, was the first big push in the country to, uh, to try to improve conditions for everyone and to hold the people who had power and money accountable. Um, it's very easy when you have power and money to get away with things. And so the reformers wanted to try to stop that. And they wanted to see if they could, the immigrants could get better jobs and better housing. It, Reese believed that it was the terrible living conditions that made children sometimes turn to crime. Um, they, they, they were basically good, he thought. There was, there was not like some, they weren't bad people because they were immigrants. They came to a situation that was very difficult. And sometimes being in those crowded and, and poor conditions, they might, they might break the law. But he thought that if you improve the conditions, you would, you would reduce the crime, you'd get kids educated, they would get good jobs and, and things would improve. And for some kids, you know, these conditions were so bad that it, it meant that they were, they were often sick or even died because of bad sanitation um, in particular. He was, uh, as in, within the progressive movement, there were journalists like Reese who were called muckrakers. And that referred to, you know, muck being like dirt or mud, something unpleasant and they were raking through it and trying to to show the people around uh, the rest of the country what was going on so he was one of the first uh, of what you would call a muckraker uh, the next picture I'm going to show you is bandits roost which um, again this is one of his more famous pictures this is an alley in a part of um, New York City that was called Five Points. And I think this in particular was Mulberry Bend. And you can see, I, I'm sure this was not staged. I'm sure he just walked down and saw these people and took the picture. And again, it's, it's, you get a little bit of sense of you know, the garbage and the, and the barrels and just the very crowded uh, alleyway. And the title implies that that maybe some of these uh, guys hanging out there were, were criminals, but I'm sure he didn't know that for sure. Um, we, we don't know, but, but you know, they don't look very happy with their, with their condition of their lives. They're not, they're not in, a, in a nice suburban home or a rural area where they can get out and enjoy nature. It's just, uh, this is their life. They're living in these crowded alleys and crowded streets. And um, actually one of the things that Reese was able to do would in part because he became friendly with a very powerful man named Theodore Roosevelt, who later became president, he was able to get the city to clean up 
some of these uh, worst, worst areas, including Bandit's Roost. Um, so they, they were able to la later turn the area into a park where kids could play. Um, and, and some of the worst apartment buildings and saloons and things like that were torn down to, to create open space or to create better housing. So Reese, you know, his, his work was documenting what he saw, but there was also trying to get the changes made. And he was successful. He was able to make, make changes because people saw and read what he reported about and decided that it was time to, uh, to do something to help the immigrants in, in these slums. Um, I'm going to go on. Yes, this, I was going to say, I'm going to go on to Susie. Susie, one of the things that he uh, Reese did was I, I mentioned before was showing kids, showing how the kids lived. And this girl, I believe, was about ten, and you can't really tell, but she's working, making, uh, I think, covering these tin boxes that then she or other kids would go sell on the street. And um, he, you know, he he knew that because they had to work to help support their family, they were not getting the chance to make money. Now, Susie was maybe unusual. She did go to school at night, but during the day, she was working, trying to, to make money for her family. And the picture you can see there, there's a blur where her hands are. And that's, um, I think that's partly because the, the picture, the photography of the day wasn't very good. It, wouldn't, it couldn't catch things in motion very well. But I think he also, Reese wanted to show that she was how fast she worked. That she she was working at this this really fast pace. Um, so yes, the child labor uh, became much more of an issue for the progressives after Reese. Um, there was another progressive muckraker, photographer and writer, who helped really push for um, laws to to limit how many how how old kids could be to work, how much they could work. Um, his name, the other photographer was named Lewis Hine. And if you read uh, Exposing Hidden Worlds, he's, he gets a sidebar. And I actually wrote an entire book about Lewis Hine and his efforts. And that was the one I referred to earlier called Breaker Boys. Uh, Breaker Boys were young kids, usually immigrants or children of immigrants who worked in coal mines in, um, in Pennsylvania and other places. But he, Lewis Hine really focused on the ones in Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, this picture, I think, like Reese's, just shows people who are not very happy with their existence. I mean, if you were eight or nine years old and you had to go in a coal mine every day, I don't know if you'd be too crazy about that. I, I think, you know, school might be a drag at times, but it's got to be better than working in a coal mine, especially because a lot of these kids would get injured, some would get killed. It was very dangerous work. They were, they were you know, taking um, or working where the coal was going through these 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 big shafts after it had been mined, and uh, so Hein Hein Hein's work was was like Reese's trying to show a problem in the larger world and and get people to want to change it. He went into fact Hein went into factories all over the country, and he had to um, often sneak in his camera because business owners didn't want people to see what the conditions were like. They didn't want to see little kids working for 12 hours a day and maybe getting injured. They, so Hein had to be a little sneaky and, uh, and to get his camera in. And again, you know, we're talking different technology. It's not like he had a cell phone camera that was easy to hide. It was a much bigger camera. Or he, if he didn't hide it, he would say he was doing something than what he was. He wouldn't say he was trying to uncover problems. He would say he was just doing a report for some government agency or, or something. He would try to create a story that would make the owners let him into the factory so he could see what things were like. Um, this book is also available on the My, My On platform, which I guess you guys have access to. I've assumed some of you read the Reese book through that. Um, so I'm speaking of that, I'm wondering if you did read the book digitally through My On, did, how, how does that experience compare to reading a, a right physical book? I mean, do you prefer one or the other? Um, what, what's, what's it like using the, uh, the digital stuff? It was easier for me to take notes on a digital one. Yeah. I like the digital one because it had like more options. Like I like the, um, I like the like physical one because it had like more options. Mm -hmm. And like, 
it like it had like um like stuff that I actually like. Do you do you use the Mayan uh yeah, platform a lot? Is that something yeah. you guys like to use? Yeah. I think one of the points that I, I, I thought of as I worked on the book was that while Reese and the progressives were able to address certain issues like child labor, they did get laws passed that said you had to be somewhere in your teens to, to go to work. You had to do a certain amount of schooling. Um, there were laws that were passed to improve sanitation in cities. But some of the problems um, of that time that if immigrants face and that other people face, they're still with us. And one of those is homelessness. There's a picture, yes, there. these are people waiting to uh, get in for the night uh, to sleep at a police station. And, and Reese actually worked to, to stop that practice because the police stations weren't equipped for, to handle homeless people. I and mean, they'd end up sleeping on the floor or on a wooden board or something. You know, he wanted them to have better shelters where they could get a good night's sleep. But uh, this is a scene you'll still see today, you know, people lining up in front of homeless shelters waiting to get in for the night. Um, so obviously the, the progressives were not able to solve every problem and uh, it's one we're still tackling today. There's been re many reports lately this year about the homeless populations uh, increasing in a number of cities. And I did a little research again and I saw that in Houston, um, I think this is maybe not this year, maybe last year, there were about 4,000 homeless people on any given night in Houston. And at least a thousand of them can't find a place to stay. So they, they don't have a shelter where they can go. I mean, I don't know if, I, I've heard stories, I don't know if this is true in Houston, you know, people are living in their cars. Um, and and he, homelessness has actually gone down in Houston, which is a good thing. But as I said, it's in other cities, it's become more of a problem, especially in California. It's been in the news about the homeless problems in California. and it's not just people who don't have work. It's there are people who have jobs, but they just don't make enough to afford the housing where they live. And so that's why they become homeless or they sleep in their cars. Now, Jacob Reese published his book, How the Other Half Lives, more than a thousand years ago, a thousand, a hundred years ago, excuse me. Um, I was wondering, what, do, you, do you guys think it's important to, to know about what he did and what he saw? I mean, what? Is, what, well, how does it strike you today when you see it? Is it just like you see old black and white pictures and it doesn't really mean anything or, or is what, he, what he's showing really say something to you? Yes, uh, when I see the pictures in the book and like on screen and like in hand, it does affect uh, the way I perceive a lot of things in life, mainly uh, because it's a problem back then and it's still a problem now, um, even though it's gotten better a little bit. Um, but I think also that the black and white pictures are better than the, the color pictures, mainly because you can see the contrast between the two. Like, yes, um, you see this picture, but then now there's tents to help. But there's also a problem where these tents are not going to shelter them um, for the cold winters, that, such as the season uh, now, because it is cold outside. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't... I don't. I want. I don't want to say that um, that the problem is bad. Like the problem um, is working. I think that the people above that have the money to help the problem aren't working as hard. Enough. Hmm. That's good. Thank you. And I thought you made a good point about the black and white. Um, I, I agree. I think there's even though we don't see many black and white pictures these days, I think when we do see them, they can have a really strong impact, especially with light and shadows, things like that. And um, actually when his photos kind of were, were forgotten for a while, and then in the 40s, uh, another photographer found his photos and started, you know, cleaning them up. So, I mean, he, he would make the images a little sharper or make them or crop them, which you probably know is, you know, to cut it down to focus on something um, in particular. And so, you know, that's a form of manipulation too but i think that's a much more accepted form as far as photographers have always altered their pictures a little bit tried to make them better a little clearer and maybe crop to focus on something um which of course is much different than when, with photoshop where you can just put somebody else's head on a body and you know if unless you're really good at detecting it you won't know well i'm gonna i'm gonna jump up to today i mean as i said at the beginning i think the the work is relevant 
Lisa's work is relevant because immigration is still such a big issue. Um, you probably have heard of the dreamers, the, the, the kids who were brought to this country when they were younger. Um, and now they're, they've gone to school and, and under President Obama, they're allowed to get jobs. And now their status is kind of in question. Uh, the government today is you know, trying to end the, the DACA program, which is about the dreamers. Um, there, we've had lots of news reports about the families being split up at the border because they're seeking asylum and kids and parents have been split. So there's a lot of um, issues that are still very, very heated about immigration. And um, I think in general, we can see, we see images of these things, but there have been times when journalists have not had access to the detention centers uh, in Texas and elsewhere, um, or they were allowed in, but they couldn't film or speak to people. So, you know, I think people in the government realize that images can be very powerful. So, so that if they don't necessarily want people to see an image that isn't a good one. Um, you know, Reese didn't have restrictions on what he could, he could photograph for the most part. So he was able to show the reality. Um, do you think it's important for people to be able to see what, what goes on, say at a, a, a border crossing or a detention center? I mean, it's, why, why would it be important for people to know what's going on? Do y'all think it's important? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Why not? So you can see the real real. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, I think it's uh, important mainly because um, certainly like in this area, you don't see a lot of that. Um, but from where I come from and where I live, I do see a lot of uh, looking down on because of where you came from or because of uh, where you live. And I don't think that um, that it's okay to have an opinion based on somebody's background or outcome in life. Um, I do have a question about like your your books. Do you um? Like you have organizations that like like for each book you sell, like you give uh, a certain amount to another organization, like for immigrants or homeless people or just schools. Unfortunately, no. Um, you know, I write these books for a publisher. They hire me, and they're they're looking to make money. And I don't, you know, I can't say that they don't give money to causes like that. I just don't know about what they do specifically. Um, I do know, you know, they and I, like we give books to schools. I mean, I get copies of all my books and I'm always giving them to schools. That's the little thing that I can do. But, um, you know, again, most of these com the companies are, are, are looking to make money. So I, I just don't know if, if they do or not, but that's a great idea. I mean, I would love to talk to my editors about that to see if they do have something set up where a percentage of their sales goes to nonprofits. That's a, that's a great idea. Um, well, I'm going to start to wrap up. Um, oh, yep, there we go. <laughs> this was a chart I found. I, I thought it was interesting because we see, you know, we hear so much about anti-immigration feelings, but this, this graph shows, and I don't know how well it will show up for you guys, but um, the, the, the bottom line, the darkest line, is the number of people who think immigration should be kept at its prevalent well, the bottom line is the number of people think immigration should be increased. The number of immigrants allowed in should be increased. And you can see how over time it's, it's definitely gone up, even though we have this, these concerns today about the impact of immigration among some people. There, there's still a lot of people in America who, who welcome immigration. And if you can see, there's a gray line that at what reached its peak in the mid 90s at 65, 66%, 65 or 66% thought we should decrease immigration, but that number has gone down. So it, it's, it's kind of interesting that while immigration has become this big political issue, a lot of Americans still think we can take in more people and it's not gonna affect the country negatively. And then there's a chart, a table I saw, yep, there we go. And it's people th being asked on a poll, do you think immigration is a good thing or a bad thing for the country? And again, it's the same trend from 2006 to 2019, it's gone up. Not a huge amount, but nine, 9%, that's nine percentage points. That's pretty good. How many people think it's a bad thing? 
has gone down. So we have the, so today in 2019, you know, three quarters of Americans think it's a good thing and only 20% or so think it's a bad thing. And, and I think that just goes to show that people realize that immigrants come to this country because they want to make things better for themselves and they want to contribute. And, um, you know, I'm biased again, could being the grandson of immigrants who did, who came with nothing and, and, you know, were able to support a family and, and, and all that. So I, I think that there's, um, there's a lot to be said for it, but you guys might disagree. So, I mean, do you, do you think immigration is, is a good thing for the country? Well, I wanted to go on to uh, my, my last couple images, which are um, certainly a familiar sight uh, for you. And let's see, there it is. Statue of Liberty. Um, that's often been associated with, with immigrants, especially because there was a poem added to the, the statue in 1903. The poem's called The New Colossus by Emma Lazarus. And the most fi famous lines are, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched ref refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed tempest, tempest -tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Um, you know, I, th I think Reese saw the the sort quote unquote wretched that came I mean they were they were poor they were uneducated they weren't bad people but in the minds of some they were wretched and um, he saw and he saw that they faced a wretched life in the new their new home because things were so hard and he he wanted to make sure he could do something about it so that's why he he went into the the, the, the tenements and the slums and took the pictures and talked to people and tried to tell their stories um, we have a couple other pictures of Lady Liberty to, to close with. There's some statistics there too. I'm just, so you can see in 1880, around the time Reese was starting to work, 13.3% uh, of people in the country were born in another country. Um, now today, that number is, that percentage is almost the same. It's, um, let me get the next one up. Uh, yes, 12.9, so almost the same. But out of, now with a population of more than 300 million, that means we have about 40 million people who were born in another country. Um, that's a lot of people. And, you know, they, they come here looking for a better life. I, I think that's um, something that Reese believed. And I think most people who welcome immigrants believe that. So I'm going to close on that note and open it up to any questions you guys have. Um, Michael, we had a question from um, Miss Pena's class, and they wanted to know um, what inspired you to write. To write in general, huh. uh, I don't know. You know, I always tell people it's the one thing I can do pretty well, as opposed to almost anything else. So I guess it was by default. But uh, I just remember being a kid in elementary school and loving to write. And I actually, I shouldn't say this, but I would write papers for my older sister, and she'd get A's. And so I thought, oh, I guess I know what I'm doing. So. Uh, I just kept up with it and uh, didn't know I could make a career out of it because it's not easy to make a career doing it, but um, I've been fortunate to do it for a long time. Oh, great. Do we have some questions from our um, uh, classroom there at uh, Harmony School of Excellence in Sugarland? Um, I have a question about the... <laughs> I have a question about the, uh, you know, the picture of the girl and how like the, the camera didn't quite capture the the correct movement that she was making. Um, I like the point that you made about how the the older cameras um, they don't they they don't have a sense of capturing the perfect thing, but they capture what is needed to be seen. So I do like that. Um, but I do have a question about would you ever consider like if Reeves were still alive, would you ever consider um, taking on a book with him? <laughs> wow, I'd be flattered. He, 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 you know, he, he was a good, I mean, we know him more today for his photography, but he was a, a really good writer. I mean, he started as a journalist, so he wouldn't need my help. But uh, yeah, if he wanted me to, that would be great. I, I, I think it'd be fascinating to go out with someone like him into the, to the world and, and document what's going on. I actually... I keep thinking about, because I, you know, because I said, I live in New Mexico. I mean, about five hours from the border, but I keep wanting to drive down to the border and bring my camera and just see for myself what, what's, what it's like, you know, in those communities and a lot of the detention centers. I mean, I don't know how far I could get because I'm sure there's tight security, but um, yeah, I wouldn't mind being a little bit of a muckraker. Thank you. Uh, 
My, my, my question is, have you, ever had a uh, have you ever had a physical copy of one of Reese's newspapers? Not the newspapers, no. I've only seen, um, you know, excerpts from him in, in, in other books and things. I mean, I've read his, the books that he wrote, but uh, not the newspapers. Um, so, like, Reese was, like, inspired by um, his, like, he saw his um, his his siblings like die, and like right. like he he he's like he cares about children. Like he wants to give them like a faithful upbringing. What what so how wait or oh, what? Why do you think that um, Reese has like compassion for kids? You know, like well, as you said, you know he saw he saw the um, the the things in 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 his own family and other kids. I mean, he, 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 I think it's just, and of course he was a father too. So he, he had kids. I mean, I can't say for sure, but I can, I would just speculate that, you know, it really touched him when he saw little kids struggling back in, in, in Denmark and uh, he, and in, in the United States too. And so he just, he really wanted to focus on them. And I mean, it sounds like you, you read the book pretty closely. So, you know, when he did the thing with the flowers for the kids, I mean, yeah, I did read that one. What's that? I read that one. Yeah, I mean, just that little gesture of collecting flowers to give to these little kids who had nothing. It's it's not a big thing, but it, it showed his compassion for them. And and um, yeah, so saying why, you know, it's hard for me to know why, but it's obvious it came from his own. Ex I think it's obvious it came from his own experiences. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Um, since Reese knew Theodore Roosevelt, like, how did they meet and? Did he also know Franklin Roosevelt? Um, I think he did not know Franklin Roosevelt because Reese died in 14 and Rose FDR didn't really become involved in politics until a little after that. I think he met Theodore because um, Theodore was the police commissioner in New York. That's when they really started to become friendly. And I think uh, Roosevelt read, if I'm remembering correctly, Roosevelt read his stuff, um, you know, read his reporting. And so that they, and I, I don't remember if Reese sought him out once he got that job as a commissioner, but uh, Roosevelt certainly knew his work because by the time he became the police commissioner, Reese had been writing and, and taking pictures for quite a while. What is your favorite book? Most favorite book? <laughs> oh, that's a that's an impossible question to answer. Um, you know, I, 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 it's yeah, it's hard to pick any one book. Um, but you know, in general, obviously history books have, have really shaped me. I remember being a kid and reading about World War II and that just got me interested in history and reading about baseball players. Those are my two favorite subjects when I was a kid. So that's what got me interested in books. And, uh, and then from there, interested in writing. So um, what, why did you I know that we wanted to like take the pictures to show others like the bad condition that he wanted to improve things. So like, why did you wanna? Uh, why did you want to like talk talk about risk showing these pictures? Like, what really? Why did you wanna like? Why did you want to write about risk? Like, what was the problem? Why did you wanna show them? Like, what inspired you? I think because I have an interest in photography. Um, I do a lot of <clears throat> photography on my own, and because I I realized because I've done so many books in this series of captured history, I realized that pictures from out history that we still see today are important. They, they have an impact. And so I like the idea of looking at immigration and the issues about it through the pictures that he took. Well, thank you so much, um, Mr. Bergen. We really enjoyed, I think, the author talk today. And I'd also like to thank Harmony School of Excellence in Sugarland. You've been a wonderful host school. And if um, folks would like any more information, I um, have the URL up for Mr. Bergen's website. And we'll be posting the uh, recording of this talk um, on the Muses 3 website. And you can see more information about some of our other author talks um, that we have recordings of. And that's where we'll post more information about author talks to come in the future. And again, thank you so much, Mr. Bergen, and thank you, Harmony School of Excellence. You've been a great, great audience.